morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are watching the Paris FinTech Forum Communities video interview series. I'm Elliot Gotkin, and today I'm joined by teammate managing partner Yuval Tal. Great to have you with us, Yuval. Thank you for having me. Okay, so before we get cracking, let's learn a little bit more about Team 8. Okay, so uh, you've had, you're, you're an investor in fintechs, but you also build them. Tell us about the, the Team 8 model and how it differs from, let's call it the traditional path taken by VCs. So Team 8 believes, and I think we're not the only one, but we believe that starting a company should not be as dangerous as it, is, as it used to be. So the probability of success shouldn't be 1 to 10 or 1 to 100. The probability of success should be fairly high, which means before you start a company, you actually take the time to research the market fit. You take the time to find customers who's willing to pay for the product when it's ready. You find the time to take founders that can execute, that have the domain knowledge, the expertise, the know-how of, of how startup works and you put it together and you give it kind of the kiss of life and if anything I, I really believe that the biggest hole in the market is the low probability of a company to be successful and that's need to change it needs to be fairly there has to be more time plated way of starting companies in a way that it should succeed and that's what I guess teammate does and he does it in multiple multiple uh, uh, fronts so we do it in fintech we do it in cyber we do it in enterprise we do it in health uh, but it's the same logic let's take seriously the people who are who can build a company uh, myself and a few others we build sorry we build companies from scratch so I took two companies from zero to Nasdaq so we understand the space we understand how to build it's just the mechanics of building a company there's a profession about building companies. You know, it's not random. Um, so hopefully uh, that can uh, scale and, and, and work out. Right, and I think I remember when Team 8, Team 8 actually started a few years ago, I think that the first vertical, if you like, was the cybersecurity space before branching out into some of those areas you just mentioned, including FinTech. Can you give us some of the numbers in terms of assets under management, the kind of growth you've seen in your portfolio companies, uh, who some of your uh, backers are? So I, you know, I, I probably not remember all of them because I focus on building companies, not on raising the money. So I'm avoiding the questions a little bit, but we're managing about 500 millions in all different uh, groups. Uh, and those are funds only for starting companies. So that's a pretty significant number in a sense that it doesn't cost too much money to start a company. That's broken down to whatever the number is uh, that, you can st that you start companies. We also have a venture fund so a big chunk of that money goes into uh, round A and B of other companies, which is not necessarily started here. But for the most part, the kind of the claim to fame is starting company from scratch with that money. And tell me about some of your investments in the fintech space or some of the companies you're building in the fintech space or both. Um, so we built I, I, the number, the name of the LP. I really I'm sorry. I really don't remember They're all kind of weird names from all kind of weird places. So I met them, but I don't remember them. So. I know it's, I'm going to be punished for it, but I don't remember it. So um, I, I guess we can send you later on, whatever the, the name that you can share. Uh, as far as company that we build uh, in the fintech space, so we started with e-commerce. I think this is very exciting. So e-commerce is changing really fast. And even today, I think if you will try to guess what companies going to be successful e-commerce companies in five years they probably most of them haven't born yet it's really changing fairly fast it's global it's complicated it moved from a place that anyone between jobs could sell something on, online on amazon and now it's a very very deep serious profession i mean to sell online now you need to understand supply chain you need to understand market fit you need to understand uh, logistics you need to understand, understand marketing of the product you need to understand pricing you need to really really know your numbers you need to understand margins you need to be able to take uh, uh, loans and uh, from uh, different financial institutions it's a real profession um, so we see a lot of uh, adoption there so what we did in e-commerce we did two companies one it's a fintech in a sense that we let e-commerce companies who sell online to get insurance in one click so anyone who sell online need to have insurance so if he sells a dry hair dryer and someone gets electrocuted, then there's a lawsuit, and then he needs to have insurance. It's a general liability insurance standard, everybody requires it, and instead of going to, 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 
uh, insurance agent and wait for a few weeks and try to explain what online is. It's, it's a double click thing. We get all the information. We research the information. We see the history. We see the risk. We know exactly what you, what you sell. We know exactly what's going to happen. We give you a quote. We close the deal at the same instant. So that's kind of the first company. I think we are the first one who's doing it and we do it with multiple vendors. We do it globally and that's beautiful. So that's the first company and it came from understanding e-commerce fairly deep. Second company um, is we looked at, um, so almost any e-commerce has to do with cross-border. You buy the product in China, for example, or Taiwan or Vietnam, but you, for example, you, you buy the product in China and you sell it in the US or anywhere. And by definition, you're going to have a trust issue. So if you import products from China, how do you know if the Chinese manufacturer is going to actually give you the product in the quality that you want? So there's a whole trust issue. How would the Chinese manufacturer know that you're going to pay them the rest of the money or some money? So there's some, some kind of a standard to pay 30, 70, and we broke that. We said, okay, we understand that there's a trust issue and then there's a financing issue and we combine them. We're going to find, figure out the trust in China and we're going to help with mitigating that risk so anyone who wants to buy products can have different prices based on how much he pays a deposit and how much he pay at the end. In a sense, that's kind of a, in a nutshell. It goes deeper and deeper. And that's also another company. We did it one of the carriers. So there's a kind of, we come to the table with a big customer with great access to the market, with great access to capital. And it's an example of how you start a company when you already know that there are customers, that there's a model, there's a fit, there's a need, and then you just solve it. Okay, I think that kind of also overlaps perhaps a little bit with your uh, experience at Payoneer, but we'll come on to that in just a bit because uh, we've now, of course, heard about Team 8. So uh, let's now get to know Yuval a little bit better. So, uh, Yuval, like most Israelis, you did your military service, uh, serving, I think, in an elite combat search and rescue unit. Uh, we hear a lot about founders in Israel coming from elite units, going out to be entrepreneurs afterwards. What impact, if any, did it have specifically on you? I think entrepreneurs, when, when we look for entrepreneurs, we look for some level of excellence somewhere. Right, so if you'd been the best in, in, a, in piano playing somewhere and you competed in piano playing, then it's great. If you did whatever in sports and you were in like a champion of your town, that's great. But something in excellence. I think in Israel, the army give opportunity to filter and give people some kind of pro platform to excel. Uh, the unit I was in, it's very difficult to get in. It's very difficult to finish the training. It's very difficult to, to survive, mostly physically and mentally, not so much, you know, it's not a lot of mathematics. It's more you know, endurance. But the fact that you actually have a platform to express yourself and excel gives other people the legitimacy or the validation that if you commit yourself to something, you can execute through it. It's almost like if you study you know, in, in, in Harvard, it doesn't mean that you necessarily know more, but the fact that you got into Harvard and you finished school in Harvard and you met it with good grades, you get validation that someone thinks that you're smart and someone thinks that you can actually take it all the way through. So it's kind of the equivalency. It's different if you go to elite unit in the Israeli army or if you go to the intelligence technology unit, because then you can come up with a very specific expertise that you need a country to allow you to do those, those things, right? If you do some kind of a invasion into other countries, then only, only government do it. So that's kind of unique. So it's not the same, but typically the army is a, in Israel it's the army, but in any way, in any country, I think you want to express something that the person had that he have done extremely well. And it's whatever it is uh, people choose. It's a good indicator. If you haven't done anything special or crazy or unique or that, then go do it and then come back and be an entrepreneur. Not like you came out of the army, decide to found a startup and away you go. Um, so I'd be curious to know how uh, your founding of Payoneer, which I know wasn't your only startup but that you founded, um, how did your founder founding of Pioneer, one of Israel's first fintech unicorns, come about? So, first of all, I, I do think that Israel have an environment of startup, and it's a culture, and it's a culture that supports uh, entrepreneurship. It can take a lot of failure, so the fact that you start something and fail doesn't 
it's not embarrassing. You can be proud of it. So I think that's a very supportive culture of taking the risk of doing stuff. Um, and uh, so that's kind of, it's, it's a culture thing. So uh, I was fortunate enough to work in companies. It's kind of the career led me to companies that are small enough to see how uh, entrepreneurs and how startups are made. I started two companies, the first in 1999. Um, I was young. Uh, and the company the name is Border Free, and we took it all the way through the evolution and took it public in NASDAQ. Uh, before the company went public, I started Pioneer, but I already knew about the payment space. So the second time you start a company and you understand the payment, you understand that you have the contact, you have the know-how, you, you know the conferences, you can, you can know right from wrong. There's also, some, also something about FinTech, and I know this is the FinTech side, Fintech have no formal schools. There's no way you can go to school and learn about Fintech. If I only take just the payment side of Fintech, payment represent, I think, $1.8 trillion in total of revenues, right? I think all of travel, which is hospitality and planes together, doesn't make it to $1.2 trillion. So it's a very, very big space very big space with no way to study it. So I think getting into the fintech, understanding the different nuances, and I just gave example of payment, uh, makes you into a very small group of people who can create a lot of value. And I think that's the reason I stayed from first company into the second company, and then we built Pioneer uh, as a prepaid company, and then it took off to more than Right. And you, Val, I need, to, I need to kind of move on to the next section, but I just want to, I have to ask you, because people may not know this just by looking at you, so if we can be brief here, but, but you're a big fan of acro yoga. Um, for those unfamiliar with the discipline, uh, tell us what it is, why you love it, and how it helps you uh, as an entrepreneur. Um, so acro yoga, I, mean, I encourage people to go and look at acro yoga. I think it's a wonderful sport with a great deal of beauty it's basically acrobatic for poor let's call it this way it's it's uh, it's not for the gypsies or for the serious people who do it for their lives uh, but it's basic acrobatics and it's uh, it's global so you can go anywhere and you can always play with people in the, the, those communities it's a group thing so people do it together um it's it pictures very well so it, it it's very uh, for the for the social network it, it's it's very very kind of uh, take, get a lot of, a lot of likes. Yeah, it creates trust between people. And I think in many cases, if you look in entrepreneurship, etc., cetera, um, especially if you create video, you create a picture, that's, that's a, it's a baby entrepreneurship, so you create it. And the last thing I think for me is that when you go and you do a little bit of acrobatics, then you are measured by your skills regardless of the history. It doesn't matter where you studied, it doesn't matter what, what you did, it doesn't matter how many companies you took public, you go to a place, you, uh, you, you play on the acrobatic. If you're good, you're good. If you're not good, no one's going to work with you. So I think that's the reason why it's very good sharpening of the skills uh, and picture well. So I encourage people who see the clip to uh, search me out and, and, and give me a like on the Acro Yoga videos. We, we invest a lot of time. Yeah, we invest a lot of time in making those videos. It's a, lot, it's a, it's a pain. And there's a nice shot of Yuval outside NASDAQ uh, uh, doing some macro yoga if anyone wants to look at that up. But uh, of course, Yuval, a key part of this interview is to get your take on the future of finance. But first, we are going to take a very quick break, after which we're going to continue our conversation with teammate managing partner Yuval Tal. Welcome back, and don't forget, if you're not already a full member of our community, everything you need to join can be found at www.parisfintechforum.com. 
Okay, now you've out, uh, let's talk about the future of finance. Okay, so a uh, nice easy one to start with. Uh, is this now the best or worst time to be building and or investing in fintech? It's always a good time to invest in fintech. It's always a good time to invest in fintech. Um, it's, a, it's a market that is by far the biggest exist. It's fragmented, it's broken down to a tremendous amount of things. Each one of, them, each one of them grows very fast. Each one of them needs more companies to support the growth so uh, you can have synergy. So it's almost like if you look, I just give an example of payment companies. It doesn't matter if you go way back to the year 2000 when I guess internet started, e-commerce started, and you look the sequence of new companies in payment space, every year you have new companies in space that you assume is already done. So it's, there's always big companies who need small companies to help them with ingenuity and uh, innovation and complement their products and just the way it is. So it's, it's almost agnostic to conditions. That's my opinion. And you founded Payneer more than 17 years ago, way before investors were throwing money at the space. Now money or cash is becoming scarcer. Should we brace for a new breed of fintechs that put crazy notions like capital efficiency and profitability ahead of growth at any cost? I think that if you adjust yourself to the market conditions, so you're going to see these times people are going to be much more focused on margin. So if you can help margin, people are going to be focused on prevention of fraud. So that's going to be a big deal uh, because tough times kind of both inflate the fraud but also make the companies more sensitive to losses from fraud. So anything that can prevent fraud. I think banks are going to focus on efficiency. So if you can make the banks or neo banks even more, more efficient, more profitable, those companies are going to, going to flourish. If you are a neo bank, then you may want to rethink of how you're going to manage that times because any company that was focused on growth, not on profitability, going to have a hard time raising money or valuation or dilution. So that's that's just the name of the game. Uh, but I'm focusing, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm very much uh, kind of a, a single-minded, but if I if you focus on new companies, then uh, companies who provide banks with more efficiency, companies who have new payment options for the creator economy, Anything to do with creator economy is agnostic to uh, to the conditions. I mean, you should see the the trend in moving to TikTok, whatever, is so massive that it's. I mean, the, the condition in the economy is almost noise compared to the to the paradigm shift. So, so solution for creator economy is big. Um, e-commerce is is evolving. So, solution for e-commerce are very welcome because those are also agnostic. I mean, you can save, you can have volume changes in e-commerce, but the players are changing, and it's become more and more professional. So the more solution you can, can give to professional sellers, the more you're going to be uh, uh, um, wanted. Uh, growth versus cash. Growth is out. Cash is in. <laughs> right, cash is in and cash is king. And you value, you know, environmental, uh, you know, social and governance concerns have shot up the list of investors and consumers' priorities. How does this affect the fintechs that you co-found and how is it likely to impact investment in the space in future? What, what, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Are they social or the Yeah, so like ESG, ESG, environmental, uh, social and governance concerns. Okay. Uh, investors uh, and also consumers are, are more concerned about this. Uh, we've heard even people like, you know, uh, you know, Larry Fink, you know, talking about how important this is now and, you know, really perhaps and we see more uh, activist investors yeah. at uh, big companies. How is that affecting the way that uh, the fintechs that you found or that you build or that you invest in? And how do you think it will impact this yeah. space in the future? So I take the unpopular uh, approach of saying when you start a company, this is the early stage of company. You have investors who gave you X amount of money. This is the money you have for success. I would not confuse any ideological agenda other than returns or getting to a place that you are fundable for the next level. Anything. I would clean up any agenda. Not social justice, not employing all people, not trying to fix anything in the in society. There is time for it later on. But in early stages, um, 
you want to be able to take create value as fast as you can possibly can you want to create a team that works well together that create the value and you want to get everybody on the same probably lowest common common denominator which is creating value and value is commercial value that is appreciated by a next investor who's willing to put the money nothing else if the market dictates that the next level will require you to have a mission or whatever it is then it's part of the rules of the game but I wouldn't push any agenda because I care about something when you get profitability then you can push a lot of agenda then it's a whole different game but initially it's more of a survival and that's what I expect from uh, entrepreneurs is to basically give everything to jump to the next level to the next level until you have some kind of a breathing room Okay, so look, uh, Yuval, it's time now for our rapid fire round of questions. So I'm just going to uh, get my timer ready because we've only got 90 seconds to, to rattle through these. Um, so my time is now on 90 seconds. Uh, are you ready? Yes. Okay, great. So just one word answers is all I'm really looking for here, Yuval. So timer on, away we go. So look, most successful fintechs we know are still very well funded, but are still losing lots of money. Is this okay for now, or is this something we should worry about? Wor worry about. What fintech, segment has, what fintech segment has the biggest potential over the next five years? Anything to, to do with creative, uh, the creative economy. What is the biggest pain point in your everyday financial life that you'd like to see resolved? Uh, supply chain. Supply chain is think we're at the beginning. Sorry, no, sorry. Do you think we're at the beginning, middle, or end of the fintech wave? We are. It's continuous. It's always a beginning. Do you have a metaverse strategy? Can you repeat the question? Do you have a metaverse strategy? Um, I'm still learning it. I'm still learning <laughs> Do you it. I don't, think know, I don't know if it's a solution looking for. So I don't. I don't have a, a strategy. Okay. Uh, it's still a solution right. looking for the problem, and I'm curious to see the problem. Have uh, European and US regulations kept pace with all the uh, uh, new possibilities and behaviors that we're seeing in the financial industry? No, it's a huge problem. How would you it's describe non-fungible tokens, Yuval, NFTs? Are they a scam, an interesting concept, or a part of the future that we really don't want to miss out on? It may be part of the future in the creator economy, intertwined okay. with copyright. <laughs> All right, Yuval, unfortunately, we're out of time for the rapid fire round and for our conversation as a whole. So I really just want to thank you, teammate, uh, managing partner Yuval Tal, for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we will be back again next week with another big name from the world of finance and technology. We do hope that everyone watching will be able to join us again then. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the Paris FinTech Forum YouTube channel and to follow us on Twitter at Paris Fin Forum. That's all for now. See you next time. Bye bye.